Yeah, we got a dreadnought here. Damn. It's the dreadnought. Hey guys, today we're gonna be talking about the forbidden dreadnought. I've been riding this bike for almost a year. I put it through some of the worst conditions imaginable. Did a five day back to back enduro race, race in the snow, just ridden it shit tons. We're in New Zealand now. I've put it through a few races here, ridden it in the mud. I think I am well qualified to talk about the durability and the performance of this bike. Uh, I was sponsored by them, but I am not any longer. So I'll be giving you my full honest reviews. Yeah, that's about it. Let's jump into it. So. I arrived on this bike because it's really one of the few bikes I was interested in riding. For me, geometry is a massive deal. I've just come to learn that being a taller rider, I like a more balanced ride with a longer rear end. And for racing, enduro especially, uh, just that balance that comes with a longer chain stay just gives me so much more confidence, uh, puts a lot more grip on the front wheel, um, and overall just makes the bike a lot easier to ride. So. Forbidden has size specific chain stays. That's one of my favorite things about them. They are proportional to each size. So each size actually has the same front to rear center ratio as the rest of them. Uh, some companies just lengthen them by a few mils here and there, but uh, Forbidden actually has the chain stays match like the same ratio to preserve the same ride feel. So I really like that. This is a large, I'm just under 6'1", and it fits me awesome, and that puts this bike at a 450 mil chainstay and a 484 mil reach, I believe. So this bike fit me really well. It took me a few months to get set up, but once I figured it out, uh, I was really happy with it. I think the main thing had to do with getting my cockpit set up uh, with that longer reach and that long chain stay it really allows you to run your bar super high and uh, as i kept getting my bars higher and higher it kept feeling better and better it just took me a while to get it all the way into that direction um, also landing on a good fork setting for this olin's fork uh, generally going stiffer on that as well um, just really put the spike in a place where it was so confidence inspiring and where some bikes feel really good when you're cruising around um, and then when you start pushing them they kind of hit a ceiling and st weird stuff starts to happen this bike how i have it set up right now it's almost the opposite where on chiller trails or if you're just cruising it doesn't feel that great it feels a little harsh but as soon as you start pushing the limit i really haven't been on a bike at least a trail bike that gives me so much confidence and composure to where when you're going close to your max speed it makes you feel comfortable the bike feels like it has my back it's really brought a lot of consistency and calmness to my riding when i'm pushing at that level and i just feel so comfortable and taken care of by this bike when i'm really trying to go fast especially once i found this setup and since i've gotten here i maybe found how it's set up right now in may and i haven't really touched a single thing since besides some fork tunes for uh different areas of riding but overall that's my favorite thing about this bike is the geometry and then the suspension definitely complements it as well so being a high pivot bike uh it has some interesting handling characteristics um, basically being a high pivot the rear axle has a fully rearward axle path, so the chainstay is growing even longer as you go through the travel. And really, that just adds a lot of composure with what I was saying, like having the bike feel calm when you're pushing the limits. A lot of that has to do with the char characteristic of the bike getting more stable as you go deeper and do its travel. And the area where you're going to need the most adjustment is in corners. But once you learn how to ride this bike and use that stability to your advantage, I think it's an absolute asset to your riding. And I actually really like how this thing corners, um, especially when leaning into like really nice supported berms. This thing just lengthens and just lets you lay into them. And it just gives you no reason, no hesitation. And the bike just carves. Um, on flat corners as well, that same geometry just like really keeps the front end planted. Um, the only 
place where maybe it's a little weird is where you're going through a lot of suspension travel quickly and trying to turn all at once uh, just because that changes the geometry the most in a single spot and if you're trying to do that turn in that one spot then things get a little weird but you do kind of learn how to ride with and around that but it generally benefits from setting up corners well taking good lines doing your braking early and just riding well the bike really rewards you when you do that and uh, that should be the goal anyway so it almost points you towards that direction if you're not going there already. So the other adjustment you probably need to make uh, with that high pivot rearward axle design is just the balance point for manuals. Uh, you end up having to lean back a little bit more aggressively as the bike goes through its travel um, and pumping the timing is a little longer. I still feel like I'm able to get really good pumps, but the size of thing I can pump is a little bigger than it would be on some other bikes. But you kind of have to adjust for with your pumping and timing and a little bit in your cornering, although I end up liking those characteristics in those areas uh, once I got used to them. Where you really benefit is uh, in just straight line speed, momentum over successive hits, and the overall composure of the bike. That rearward axle path just gets out of the way um, you're not hanging up on rocks. There's a really low amount of feedback into your feet and it just really smooths out sections of trail that you would think a 155 mil enduro bike would have trouble with. And Connor Farron just tearing it up on the World Cup circuit on a trail bike frame like this is a testament to that. So yeah, that in that regard, I haven't ridden a bike that feels better in that area. Um, and then everything else is for me is more of an adjustment. And me being so tuned in to this bike, I don't have an issue putting it anywhere that I want on the trail. And it, I really, really like how this bike rides. And this is after I'm not even sponsored by them anymore. Like I genuinely really, really get along with this bike. My riding has grown a lot in part because of it. Um, I feel like I've gotten smoother, more confident, uh, and generally more consistent with my riding being on this bike and it definitely uh, has my back in a lot of situations. So the next thing to talk about is probably the whole idler system. The benefit there is that it isolates almost all the chain forces from your feet when as far as pedal kickback. So being a flat pedal rider this bike feels amazing. Uh, it's just super planted. I raced in flat pedals almost all year just because I had the confidence to plow through rock gardens and not have my feet blow off and yeah it's just a dream to ride on flat pedals but regardless of what pedal you choose um, you just will feel a lot less feedback and less harshness in the bike and it kind of makes the whole suspension feel like it's working a little bit better um, but that being said uh, I guess this is where we get into the durability and longevity of the bike. Um, you know, continuing talking about the idler pulley and the drivetrain setup. Uh, as far as drag, when the drivetrain's completely clean, I don't notice it at all. I feel like it pedals really efficiently. There's probably some measurable loss of efficiency, but I don't notice it at all. Really where I think drag comes into play is only when the chain gets dirty. I think since there's more kinks and bends in the chain, uh, just as the chain gets dirtier, the effect the dirtiness has on the efficiency of the whole system is much more drastic, uh, just because it yeah kinks and bends so much that it has a greater effect on the smoothness of, and efficiency of the chain. So I notice when the chain gets dry and when it gets dirty, um, I really start to notice there's a bit of drag uh, but it's pretty easily manageable unless you're riding in really muddy conditions. Even when it's muddy and wet and it stays wet, I don't think it's really that bad, but when it gets like really dry and dirty, that's when you notice it the most. Um, and then especially in the granny gear, uh, I can just tell there's a lot of drag in the drivetrain. But if you're ever in that situation or you know you're gonna be in that situation, I just carry a tiny bottle of chain lube in my bag or my strap or whatever 
and um, the drivetrain comes back to life pretty quickly. But it's not a huge deal, I don't think. It's just something to be mindful of. It's just always a good idea to have your drivetrain clean, but something extra to pay attention to on this bike. As far as the idler pulley itself goes, I did wear through maybe three of those throughout the season. So it is a wear item uh, that doesn't exist on other bikes, but there are ceramic bearings for them. Uh, there are other products that you know, claim they've got a more durable system, but I choose to run mine a little loose, like not fully cranked down just to not put as much pressure on that bearing, especially when it gets a little crunchier. But I just have a couple spares uh, if you get this bike, especially if you ride in really terrible conditions all the time, it would be a smart idea to get one or two spares of that idler pulley. Uh, for me, they weren't going out incessantly, but it is something to keep an eye on. So the last thing to keep in mind about the drivetrain is keeping your B tension in the correct spec and your chain length. Basically, you just want the correct amount of wrap on that 10 tooth cog uh, to get the teeth fully engaged with the chain. Since it's coming down at a, I don't know if it's a steeper or shallower angle, but basically you're not getting as much wrap on that last cog, uh, you can get into situations where the chain will skip. And if your chain, I guess, is too long and you have your B tension cranked to compensate, it won't be getting that wrap. I think they come pretty well specced from the factory, but if you're building your bikes, whether it's custom build or not, it would be worth to just check in the parking lot, get the bike up to speed, and then put some like really big watts down in that 10 tooth cog. Uh, and if you slip, then that just means there needs to be an adjustment with your chain length or your B tension to get more wrap. Because uh, you just don't, it's not a good feeling to have that on the trail where you go to, you know, crank, you're hauling ass and then, you know, something slips that could just put you in a bit of a weird situation. That chainstay protector, if you own the bike long enough, it's probably gonna come off. Uh, so if you don't want it to come off in an unexpected time, I would suggest just zip tying it like I did or just having an extra one of those around. Again, I think they're pretty cheap. Um, the other thing people notice is that in that 10 tooth cog, that chain comes really close, borderline touching that chain stay guard. It is really close, but you don't hear it. You don't feel it. If you're pedaling in that hard of a cog, like I don't think it really affects much. Going into the rest of the bike, uh, just with the bearings and everything else, um, I have replaced all the bearings on this bike uh, before I came to, and that was in late August. So that really improved the feeling of the bike. It had definitely been ridden in at that point plenty of wind rock, mud laps, and pressure washes. So none of the bearings were too bad, but there were some that needed attention. I'd say the bearing life was pretty standard. I've had bikes that didn't really need to be touched throughout their entire life. I've had other bikes that needed bearings replaced after their first week of riding in the wet. As far as pivots and everything, one thing you need to keep an eye on is just that lowest most knuckle that connects the two links and that thing just has a tendency to come loose. Uh, if you're building a new bike, I would recommend Loctiting it. Mine has like settled in now where it's not coming loose anymore, so I'm stoked. But for a while, um, it, almost every time I checked it, like every few rides, it needed to be uh, tightened up a little bit. And if you're feeling play in your bike, that's definitely a good place to check. Besides that, I wasn't really chasing anything on the bike. And servicing this linkage and taking it all apart is actually fairly straightforward. I was able to do it out of the back of a trailer with basic tools. Uh, I could do it right now with my Allen wrenches really and uh, one set of Nipex pliers or a crescent wrench. So it's pretty easy to work with and clean and service if you are into doing that stuff yourself, um, it's a pretty easy bike to work with. One thing I really got caught out on uh, in Transmadera is that my axle broke. So you really gotta make sure that you're running a solid axle. When these bikes first came out, they came with a hollow axle, and at some point they made a transition. So run a solid axle, it's a little heavier. But if you ride those hollow axles long enough and hard enough, um, there is a chance that they will break. 
Um, other than that, the cable routing is pretty straightforward. I have access, so luckily I only have one cable to put through the bike. Um, it did rattle for a little bit, but I just pulled them tight on both ends, cranked them down, got it to a place where there's not really room to rattle. The way they have those blocks that hold the cable is like a little cumbersome. Maybe not the absolute cleanest, but I think it's passable. Uh, it's not a pain in the ass and it looks pretty decent. So once you get the cable through there, it's not that big of an issue. As far as the durability of the frame itself, like the carbon and all that, I really haven't heard of people breaking these. Um, I actually did break a rear triangle. It was in a super bizarre crash where I went OTB and my bike fully whipped and smacked a tree. So it was a full impact crack and with carbon, those are like just gonna happen. I don't think any company is really immune to just getting their bikes whacked and uh, them breaking sometimes. So that happened to me, but I don't think it's a real reflection of a durability issue. Um, and from the riders I've talked to uh, and the company itself, there just doesn't seem to be a huge issue with these cracking, although I'm sure it's happened. I have certainly flat landed the shit out of this bike and smashed it super hard. I have full confidence in putting this bike through the ringer and uh, yeah, there's definitely, I think other bikes that would have cracked under some of the stuff I've done and this bike's held up quite well. There's some like pretty big paint chips in the down tube and the side of it, just from rocks hitting up, shrugged those off quite nicely. The space in between the seat tube and the rear triangle, it is a place that can crush rocks. So if you get something in there, if your bike's making a crunching sound, that's a good place to look. Uh, I think these bikes do come with some moto foam now that you can stuff in there that helps protect that. But then I find if it's really muddy, it kind of just clogs in there. So it is a bit of a spot where I don't really have a super good solution, but it's something to be aware of. I also put the super heavy duty mud guard on it that covers a lot of that space. And it ended up having a bit of a clearance issue and rubbing up against my frame. Uh, I think they fixed that now, but something to confirm or at least test if you're gonna be running that uh, bigger mud guard. I think it barely cleared uh, and I thought it was gonna be all right, but with the mud, um, just it got stuck in between there and wore that section of paint on my front triangle. This bike is definitely not in great cosmetic condition. I was planning on ride wrapping it, but before I could get that stuff, I did a snow race in Tennessee and it's pretty much been screwed ever since. So uh, unfortunately, yeah, this bike, it's a race bike. It just gets beat on and uh, thrown in the back of shuttle trucks, thrown on bike racks, you know, it's just takes a beating. So overall, I've had a really positive experience with this bike. Uh, there are a few things here and there that you should probably look out for or be aware of when you buy it. But having owned it for a year, I can absolutely recommend it to anyone. Um, if you're looking to race, if you're looking to just have a burly enduro bike, if you're looking to just see what this high pivot thing is all about, uh, this is an incredible bike. I can do everything from smash out bike park laps to going on like seven, 8,000 foot a uh, huge massive pedal days. I've done it all on this bike. And for being a high pivot bike that's so aggressive, I think it covers a lot of bases and uh, comes in at a pretty reasonable weight. This thing is super heavy right now just because I've got heavy tires on it, a coil shock. You know, I've got everything heavy that could ever be put on it, but uh, you can have a pretty reasonable build with this bike with double down tires around 34, 35 pounds, um, which I think is pretty spot on. With lighter tires, you can obviously go lighter, but um, for what this bike is meant to do, I think it's a pretty reasonable weight, especially with the high pivot design and the idler pulley and all those parts involved with that as well. So um, yeah, that's my two cents. Like I said, there's a whole nother video going over every part I've put on this bike and a more in-depth analysis on the frame itself. Uh, so if you're interested in that, go check it out on Vital MTB. With that being said, I think that covers it for this video. Uh, let me know if you guys have any more questions, leave them in the comments. 
Uh, let me know if there's anything else you guys would like to see on the channel and subscribe if you'd like. I'll see you guys in the next video.